Have you ever wondered how to code Minecraft? Well, I have. What you see here is not Minecraft, but it's a piece of code in C++ that I wrote as close to Minecraft as I can make it. I'm sure you've seen other Minecraft clones hanging around on the internet, but I feel like these fail to tackle some of the more common issues. Things like crafting, command line parsing, saving worlds, multiplayer, and more. So I decided to address all these in my clone. I'm still currently working on this clone, and you can check out my progress at twitch.tv slash gameswthgabe, and if you'd like to see how my progress went, you can see this video here for a brief overview of my journey. But right now, I'd like to talk about how you can code Minecraft. There is one last thing I'd like to mention before continuing with this episode. I'll be speaking from a Windows and C++ perspective. This is because I'm most comfortable with Windows and C++. So if I ever mention anything like binaries, libraries, big endianess versus little endianess, or operating system specific functions like file management, this will be coming from a Windows and C++ perspective. But that shouldn't deter you because translating these concepts to Linux and Mac are not that difficult. And I've actually translated these concepts to Linux myself. Before I begin to dive into some of the concepts for this video, let me briefly discuss some of the things you should already be familiar with. One, you should be familiar with at least one lower level language. I'm sure you could code Minecraft in a language like Python or Lua. However, it won't yield the best performance and it will actually be a little bit more difficult to implement some of these concepts in a higher level language like that. So I would suggest you should use a language like C++, Java, C Sharp, C, Rust, or some other language of your choosing that's low level. Two, you should be familiar with how to use memory operations on a PC. In order to code a game like Minecraft, we have to use some memory operations to access different pieces of hardware like the GPU. Now, you don't need to be super familiar with memory operations and I'll highlight any particularly difficult pieces of code, but you should be somewhat familiar with the way memory works on a computer. There is one last thing I'd like to mention before beginning this series. This is not going to be a series that will teach you how to code Minecraft by showing you every single line of my code. I've followed programming tutorials like this before, and I feel like I haven't really learned from them. But I have followed some tutorials that teach you concepts and give you challenges to implement those concepts. This is the style of tutorial series that I will be using for this. So I will explain concepts and I will ask you to do challenges at the end of each episode. And if you complete every single challenge, you should end up with a working Minecraft clone by the end of this. There will of course be code examples where applicable. And if you want to see complete code, I will leave links in the description so you can see how to complete the challenges. With that in mind, this is a list of topics that we will cover as we go through this series, roughly in the order that I will cover them. There are some other topics I'd like to go over, but I haven't completed implementing myself yet. Some of these topics include multiplayer systems, deferred rendering, ray tracing, animated blocks in different block types. So this should give you a rough idea of what this series will cover and the order we will be going over these different concepts. Starting a large project can be difficult, but there's usually a couple of things you know you can do immediately. With our Minecraft game, our to-do list is pretty short for the time being. There's a few things that we know we need to do at once. The first thing we need to do is decide on a graphics API. The second thing we need to do is to get a window running. And then finally, we need to get input working. So let's talk about each of these in turn, and these will be our goals for this episode. In order to code a game like Minecraft, you need to decide on a graphics API. That way we can access the GPU. Now, there are a few publicly available graphics APIs available. DirectX, OpenGL, Vulkan, Metal, and a few more. So we need to decide on which one we will be using for this series. Throughout this series, I will be using OpenGL and referencing OpenGL function calls, but most of the concepts should remain pretty similar across these APIs. If you've never done graphics programming before, I would highly recommend sticking with OpenGL as it's one of the simpler APIs available. Now that we have a graphics API selected, I'll be using OpenGL, let's talk about creating a window. Creating a window is a little bit more complicated than it might appear at first. I would highly recommend using a window management library for this part since it's the simplest way to get a cross-platform window running. There are two main choices out there, GILFW, which is Graphics Library Framework, and FreeGlute. I would recommend using GILFW because I believe it has a clear API and its documentation is a little bit easier to read, but you're welcome to use whichever API you find easier. In addition to a window library, you'll need a function loader for OpenGL. Now, 
What is a function loader, and why is it necessary? Well, since OpenGL is only a specification, it's up to the driver manufacturers to create the implementation of OpenGL functions. Let's look at a concrete example. Imagine that you're NVIDIA, and you just released a new graphics card. OpenGL has a list of functions that it mandates must be available in order for this new graphics card to be compatible with OpenGL. So, NVIDIA will hire a bunch of engineers to code an actual implementation to all these functions, and when you add this new graphics card to your PC, you install these drivers which implement these functions. But this introduces a problem. How does our code know where to find these functions? Q, our function loader. Basically, we need to ask our operating system to look for the OpenGL functions that are not readily available, and our operating system will return a function pointer that we can use to call the OpenGL functions that will eventually execute some instructions on the graphics card. So this all sounds pretty complicated, and you can do all this manually, but there's an easier way. Instead of manually writing code to find all the function pointers and give them to us so that we can use OpenGL, we can just use a library. There are a few different choices. You can use Glad, Glue, Gladder, Glee, and more. I'll be using Glad for this tutorial series, and I would recommend it because it's simple to use, and most of GLFW's documentation assumes you'll be using this library. All right, so now that we've chosen our libraries, we need to link the libraries to our code so that we can actually use them. On Windows, this basically means that we add the DLL or lib file to our linked libraries, or we compile the source code manually. If you're using a language like C-sharp or Java, you can just use a library that wraps around this whole process and you don't have to worry about linking. If you're using a language like C++ or C though, you need to ensure that you either compile GLFW source code manually as part of your build, or that you provide the DLL or lib file and link to it appropriately as part of your build. I'll link a tutorial in the description for this process in case you want to look at this further. Finally, we can use our library to get a window up and running. For GLFW, this is pretty simple. We can write a few lines of code that look like this. Now, let's explain what's happening here. First, we call GLFW's initialization function. If that fails, we can log an error message in return. Next, we provide the window hints. This is where you would specify whether you want to be able to resize the window, minimize the window, or any other available window hint that you can find in GLFW's documentation. After that, we declare a few helper variables for our window creation. Next, we try to actually create the window. We give it the width, the height, and the window title that we would like. The last two parameters are for the monitor and the window you would like to share resources with. After we check if the window creation succeeded, we make its context current and initialize GLAD. Making the window's context current is an important step to ensure that OpenGL will flush all of its rendering results to our window. If we fail to initialize GLAD, we print an error and return early. Next, we call GL viewport with our window width and height. This just tells OpenGL which pixels we would like to draw to. For example, if you made it go to half the window width and height, you would see your rendering results in the bottom left half of your window. Finally, we enter into our game loop. This is where the core game will be run from. We first check to see if an event has been passed to the window that signals it can close. This can be triggered from something like the user clicking the close button, or a hotkey that you program to trigger the close event. Next, we clear our window screen to a reddish color. We call GL clear with GL color buffer bit to ensure the color gets refreshed every frame. We'll talk more about this in the next tutorial. Then we swap the buffers. This is basically GLFW's way of double buffering. When we call this function, we swap the buffer we were last drawing to to be rendered on our screen, and we swap the buffer that was just being displayed into the back buffer to be drawn to. Next, we pull for any new events. This will query the underlying operating system's mechanism for processing all window events. Window events include things like window resizing, the user moving their mouse, the user clicking, or the user typing, and more things. All these events will get processed, and their appropriate callbacks will be called when we call GLFW pull events. This is great, but what if you want to set certain parameters? What if you want to start the window in full screen mode, or set a specific window icon? You can achieve all of these using different GLFW function calls. Most of the time, you'll use the function GLFW window hint, which lets you set many different parameters such as whether you can resize the window, whether the window is visible on creation, whether the window has a title bar, and more. You can find the documentation in the description. Now that we have a window up and running, it would be great if we could handle input. How do we do this? Well, since we're already using GLFW, we can handle input pretty easily. The typical way to handle input is using one of the many GLFW set callback functions, where these are like GLFW set key callback or GLFW set mouse callback, and these handle the different input types respectively. 
Let's go through a simple example and add an event callback for keyboard input. To do this, we can use jillfw's function jillfw set key callback. This is what the documentation for this function looks like. As long as our key callback matches the key callback signature, we will have a valid callback function. The last thing we need to do is register the key callback before we enter into our rendering loop. That way, every time we call jillfw pull events, it will call our callback if the user has pressed any keys on the keyboard. Let's use a simple function to test this. Now, when a user presses and releases a key, we should see a message alerting us about it. JLFW has several other callbacks that we can use to identify and respond to user input. We can handle game controllers, mouse movement, and keyboard input using these callbacks. Now that we've explored how to create a window and set up various different hints and input handlers, here are your challenges for today. One, create an entry point for your application. This is the main class in Java or your main function in C++ or your main class in C Sharp. Two, inside this entry point, create your window and then start your game loop. Three, if you have multiple monitors, add support for switching the different monitor on startup. Four, add the ability to launch your game in full screen mode. Five, add event handlers for keyboard and mouse input. And if you have controllers, try and add input handlers for controllers as well. These challenges should utilize everything that we've talked about in this episode. And if you'd like a simple function to test these capabilities, you can use this function right here. Now your APIs don't need to look like what I've described here. This is simply an arbitrary reference that should show you how it could look. That wraps up this episode. Stay tuned for the next episode where we will begin talking about OpenGL and OpenGL objects. Lastly, I'd like to thank all the new subscribers I've gotten recently. It's great to see the channel grow, and it's also great to have such an amazing community to engage with. If you have any questions or concerns about this tutorial series or any of the topics that I've mentioned, feel free to join the Discord and discuss this as a community with us. Like, if you think that I should cover certain topics sooner or later, definitely reach out to me. Do not hesitate, because I would love to discuss this. But that is it for this episode. Thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time.